Hello and welcome to our last lecture of the course. So today we're going to be picking up where we left off, uh, talking about Constantine and this new religion in Rome called Christianity. And then we're also going to be looking a little bit at the legacy of Rome. So how did we get from uh, Rome, from Constantine, all the way to our class today, the, the fact that we're studying Rome, how did that kind of trajectory all happen? Um, so a bit of a two-parter, uh, but a good way to conclude our course, I think. So last time, just to refresh your memory, we talked about uh, the, the ascension of Constantine to the throne, uh, his, his move from being one of four, one of the tetrarchs, to being the sole emperor. So uh, that transition in political structure, that transition in power, and we talked about this pivotal moment in 312 at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge when Constantine has a dream of the, the Cairo, that, that, that P and that X, which is really a, a chi and a rho. Um, and the angel shows him this sign and says, with this sign, you shall conquer. And then he does. And that kind of uh, spurs something in him toward Christianity. It begins a slow conversion. He doesn't convert right away. Remember, we looked at those coins where he's still doing some pagan imagery, some Christian imagery on both of them, kind of trying to play both sides, appeal to all people but it definitely starts a new trend, one that is very different from emperors uh, who came before him like Diocletian or those of the third century crisis who actively persecuted Christians. So we are beginning um, a new kind of attitude toward Christianity. And there's another pivotal point in the year after the Battle of the Milvian Bridge in 313, the Edict of Milan, which legalizes Christianity in the empire. So you can no longer be persecuted. It doesn't mean we're a fully Christian empire and everyone has to convert. It just means that you won't be punished for being a Christian. So that's kind of where we left off. But uh, to, to start this lecture, I'm actually going to back up a little bit and kind of uh, fill in some gaps that we haven't talked about yet. So what is Christianity? <laughs> um, we haven't really talked about kind of the basics of it, how it developed. Um, I know that a lot of you might be familiar with kind of the basic tenets of it, but I just want to go over it in case we're not all familiar. So um, Christianity is uh, uh, based around uh, Jesus Christ, who is a historical figure. He's uh, attested to in historical documents, um, Roman historical documents. So Romans at the time talk about this guy existing. Um, and he was said to be the son of God, and he proclaimed this, and his followers believed this. Uh, he was Jewish, so he was living in Judea, the province of Judea. He was Jewish by birth. Uh, he was he was a Jew uh, in his, his religious kind of upbringing, um, but he's going to start this, this new religion based around this idea that he is the son of God, and he is the savior who has come down to earth. So he was born around the year zero, uh, which is where our dating system comes from. So our dating system is based off of uh, kind of the rough year of his birth. It probably isn't exactly the year zero, but it's kind of around there. Um, as I said, he was living in Judea um, and his teachings, uh, he starts this ministry. Uh, he's, he's a teacher, a rabbi even, um, and he preaches about a few main things, um, which is a big one is the afterlife. So the idea that the, the next world is, is more important than he, this world. And so everything we do in this life should be working toward, uh, toward heaven, toward, toward reuniting with God in heaven afterwards. So that's a big thing. And kind of based on that is then the need for good morality and faithfulness in this life. So uh, good works, you know, you know, charity, uh, helping the poor, helping your neighbor, um, and then also uh, faithfulness. So, so loving God, being faithful to God in this life. So those are kind of the things that he preaches and that kind of all wraps up with the afterlife because if you do in those things in this life, um, then you'll be kind of rewarded in heaven afterward. Um, he's crucified around the year 33. So he is put to death uh, on a cross. Um, and uh, he was mainly seen as a threat kind of both by very pious Jews as well as Romans. So the fact that he was preaching this new religion and also uh, gaining a lot of followers, a lot of people were kind of interested in what he was saying, um, that was seen as a threat. And so he uh, was killed. And then if you if you continue reading in the Bible, he is he's raised uh, after three days, right? And that's kind of his um, resurrection. Uh, that's what, what Easter is based around nowadays, right? Um, so uh, once he uh, is crucified uh, in, in the Bible, ascends to heaven, um, he, uh, his writings gain more and more traction after um, he is gone. So 
Uh, there are four men who write down accounts of his life. Well, actually, there's a lot more, but there's kind of four official ones who we we take as as authentic. Um, so these these uh, gospels they're called the four gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, so they detail the life of Christ, his ministry, all these things that he did. And so that was a good way to spread spread this new religion because you have something written down, and, and those who are literate can can read uh, what happened. But it's also done a lot by word of mouth. So uh, Christ's disciples kind of act as missionaries and they, they carry this, his message um, throughout the empire. And so uh, there's a book in the Bible called the Acts of the Apostles and that chronicles their kind of what happens next, kind of the sequel <laughs> where all of these disciples go off to you know, massively different parts of the empire um, and preach the gospel and, and uh, convert a lot of people to Christianity. Um, but you know, as we've talked about a lot, it was not an accepted religion for hundreds of years, you know. So this was either done in secret or it was uh, done openly, but then the people were punished. So we have lots of accounts of martyrs uh, of the early church, people who were put to death because they were Christians. Uh, for those who wanted to practice in secret, though, uh, this was often done in these kind of house churches. So they were um, often private homes of, of Christians, and they would be opened up for people to, to congregate there and to worship and to discuss Christianity and all of these things there. So uh, one that we're going to look at is an example of that uh, in Dura Europis. So this is in Syria, dates to kind of the middle of the third century. Um, that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a private house. So it's a courtyard house, um, you know, which we've talked about, right? So it's kind of got a courtyard in the middle and these rooms all coming off of it. Um, and we see that it was converted into a Christian uh, community house, meeting house. Um, and it was done in a few ways. So um, you have this open courtyard still, but then uh, one of the rooms had, uh, uh, it was two rooms actually. And then they broke down a wall in the middle of those two rooms to create kind of an open meeting space. Um, and this meeting place could hold like 60 to 80 people. So um, a pretty large room for, for a large congregation of people. Um, but again, this can't be done openly. And so we're doing it in homes uh, where it's a little bit more private. You know, you don't have uh, prying eyes from the authorities watching us. Um, so so it's going to be done in a home. Uh, we also uh, see that a, a platform was raised in that room. So it was raised, this is, there we go. Uh, this is the, the room. So you can see that wall that was broken down here and then it would have been turned into a large uh, meeting hall. And then we have this kind of rostra, kind of like a, a raised platform for speakers um, placed at one end. So it's clear that there was someone who was maybe a priest or some kind of preacher who was leading the, the worship, leading the congregation. So we have that spot for them here. Um, and then if we look on the other side, uh, we see a baptistry. So again, on our plan, uh, that's number three. So that's going to be on the other side of the courtyard over here. Um, and the baptistry uh, in a church or even in a house church like we have here, um, was where baptisms were done. So baptisms are the uh, ritual where new members are initiated into Christianity. Um, if they're, you know, they convert to Christianity, they're going to go through a baptism to officially kind of become part of the church, part of the faith. And it often features some kind of water uh, feature, water ritual. So you're either, you know, if you think about nowadays, maybe, you know, baptism still happen, obviously, um, water is poured on the head or people submerge entirely in some kind of water or something like that. Um, so that's what we see in this room, which is a baptistry. So this is where baptisms would take place. Uh, we see a, a font, a baptismal font at the end that would have held water. And so that's where uh, people would have been baptized. That's what kind of the, the water um, container where that would have happened, I suppose. Uh, but in this room, we see also a lot of decoration. So a lot of frescoes. Um, and that's how we know, especially that this is a, a place of Christian worship is because of the iconography in the frescoes. So um, the first one that we have in the, you know, the lower right that you see here, this little fragment, uh, not in super great condition, but you know, we, we work with what we have, um, is a uh, wall painting of a procession of women. So we have multiple women here and they're kind of holding torches maybe, um, and they're, they're lined up and they're actually facing toward the baptismal font. So they are kind of almost advancing uh, in that direction, um, kind of lined up processing. Um, but uh, we're not sure exactly what this represents, but it's thought that, um, yeah, so it could be kind of a reference to people being or about to be baptized. It could also be a reference to something in the Bible, um, which is a, a kind of a parable about, about the wise virgins who are these group of women who are waiting for their grooms, um, you know, they're about to get married. And so they, they, they await for the arrival of their grooms, um, which is kind of the same um, excitement, I guess, that one should have uh, for the coming of Christ. So that there's kind of a, it's kind of a, a metaphor there. 
So that's what this could be. Um, depicting is kind of that story from the Bible about these, these women, these virgins, um, waiting for their weddings, you know, waiting to get married. Um, and kind of excited, that excited nature, you know. And so even that is kind of the same thing because it's kind of these women who are going to be entering a new stage of life. And so we have that same thing um, in baptisms, right? If you're getting baptized, you're kind of entering a new stage of your life. So um, either way, what is this is depicting literally a, a baptismal procession or kind of this, this allegory. Um, either way, it kind of has the same meaning imbued within it. Uh, so, uh, Something that you might notice though, is that we've kind of seen things like this before. So um, something that we'll talk a lot about in this lecture is the, the way that Christians, although this was a, a new religion, um, kind of used uh, existing themes or uh, kind of tropes, pagan tropes in artwork. Um, and they use the same uh, similar artworks um, for their new religion, to express their new religion, which kind of makes sense, especially if they are kind of starting out, they're kind of fledgling and they're so immersed in a society that is so um, pagan, right? They might take uh, inspiration from that, but also they might just, that's what they know. That's what seems normal. This is how you practice religion, right? Even if it's a different religion. Um, so we can have kind of a comparison here from the, the room uh, at the Villa of the Mysteries, uh, which was that Dionysic cult. And we see a woman uh, kind of an initiation. Uh, she's preparing to be initiated into this cult of Dionysus. Um, and it kind of depicts that on the walls, all these people kind of getting ready, um, sort of uh, mimicking maybe what might happen uh, in, the, in real life when people are getting ready for rituals. Um, and it's kind of the same idea too, that you have uh, you know, multiple people kind of lined up and you can kind of look at it along the panel and, and watch a scene unfold. Um, that's a little bit what we're seeing here with these, these women who are kind of in procession. You can kind of watch them almost um, walk toward the, the baptismal font in this case. So um, similar kinds of, of, um, of tropes, like I said. And something else uh, more stylistically that we see is also this use of, of registers. Um, so if you look here, it's kind of, we've got multiple registers like we've been seeing for centuries in Rome, um, the same style of wall painting, um, or you maybe have some kind of, of delineator between different scenes that are happening. Um, and also if you even look at the color palettes, sort of this, this, this red pigment that they use um, and the same red pigment that they're gonna use as the background um, in the Villa of the Mysteries. So again, uh, uh, sort of thematically similar scenes taking place, but also stylistically similar with those different registers um, and different bands of decoration that we're seeing, similar colors, all of that. If we continue, so if we're looking at the baptismal font now, um, sort of in this area above, uh, in that niche kind of, so above the actual where the water would be, um, we see this wall painting of Christ as the good shepherd. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, it's, it's not in the best condition, um, but you can kind of see a, a drawing of it or a reconstruction of it here, um, sort of easier to see when it's not all um, in those colors. <laughs> um, so what we see here is uh, a reference to a couple things. So the first is Christ as, as the good shepherd, um, which also is uh, closely tied to teachings in the Bible. There's, there's lots of talk of um, Christ as the shepherd and his, his flock, which are the people, his followers, uh, you know, members of Christianity. Those are the flock, the congregation, and then he is the shepherd. So he's leading them, right? Um, and there's sort of multiple parables that go along with that stories that he tells. Um, one of the most famous is, is you know, that, the, that Christ will leave the 99 to go find the one sheep who is lost. Um, so lots of references to this kind of uh, pastoral idea um, of a shepherd and his, and his sheep. And it's going to be a really common theme in Christian artwork, especially in this period um, of Christ as a good shepherd. So get used to seeing this. Um, it'll almost always be, uh, you can kind of look here to see it better. Um, it'll be Christ standing there and then he's going to have a sheep on his back. Uh, so this actually might be a reference to the parable that I just mentioned. Uh, maybe all of the sheep are, are kind of hanging out here and he's just returned from bringing back the one. Um, so he's just gone and found the one and now he's bringing it back to the flock. Um, so kind of a reference there, um, very common though, uh, like we'll see, 
Um, and then also there is a, a small, again, hard to see depiction probably of Adam and Eve. So those are figures from the Old Testament. Um, so ones that had been around in Jewish religion for a long time, uh, talking about kind of the birth of man, the creation of humanity, uh, being born of Adam and Eve, and also their, their fall into sin. So um, sort of setting the, the whole tone for humanity going forward. Um, but we see Adam and Eve here, and it looks like maybe there's a tree in between them. So maybe they're in the Garden of Eden. Um, again, kind of hard to tell, um, but maybe some kind of... Um, uh, mirroring here between Old Testament and New Testament, uh, New Testament being the teachings of Christ, the life of Christ, all in the New Testament, um, maybe sort of some kind of um, uh, relationship there that that Adam and Eve, you know, the first kind of original sin, it's called, um, and then Christ coming to redeem that, coming to bring back one from the flock. Uh, so we see this sort of uh, duality here, maybe even referencing each other. Because um, otherwise it might be kind of random, you know, it's kind of a, an odd composition in a way uh, that you have this one main scene and then you sort of have another smaller scene over here. Um, so the point is not as much the scene itself, but the, the meanings imbued within that. And um, just to make the point again that we're in uh, a baptistry, so a place where people are uh, being converted to Christianity, being initiated into the church. So um, perhaps the uh, also the kind of iconography that we're seeing here um, of, of sin and then being brought to, into the flock, right? So there's like Adam and Eve, which kind of represent uh, sin, the fall of man, and then we have Christ bringing back one to the flock. So maybe the person being baptized is that one that he's bringing back. So um, sort of a whole, whole kind of uh, reference to, again, the room that we're in. And then lastly, um, in the baptistry, so if we're also looking on this wall here, uh, here was the procession of women, and then here was that that we were just looking at, the Good Shepherd. Um, and then we're looking right here, which is also so hard to see. These are just really not in great condition. Um, but this is a wall painting of Christ healing the paralytic. So yet another scene from the Bible um, where Christ heals a man who cannot walk and he gets up out of bed and is then able to walk uh, after Christ heals him. So lots of miracles that happen in the Bible. Um, and so once again, uh, we're kind of seeing similar to the other two, um, something that's happening right in the middle of the story. So we're, we're jumping into the action. Um, it's one scene that's sort of, sort of supposed to represent a larger story. So it's not depicting the entire story. Um, we're not seeing like an episodic narrative. We're not seeing that actually, because we're not seeing, uh, you know, like a comic book, every scene, you know, from beginning to end. Um, but we're just seeing one scene and there's so much meaning imbued in that one scene. That one scene is supposed to reference a whole entire story. So kind of the idea um, that maybe people weren't uh, super literate necessarily, but they still knew the stories of the Bible very well. And so by um, looking at these images, they're not necessarily trying to learn the stories of the Bible. They kind of already know it, um, but it's, it's a reference. It's that when you see that, you go, oh, I'm reminded of the entire story and of the message. And I understand what, you know, what I'm supposed to get out of that. Um, so this is the idea of kind of Christ as healer. Um, and that's, that's uh, like I said, another, another story that they would have been familiar with. Um, if we look at the kind of style of this, um, we see that it's in a way similar to some of the late antique art that we've seen. Um, it's kind of difficult to see, I know, um, because they're, they're so simplistic, but I mean, that is a bit more late antique. Um, and so we see uh, uh, quite abstracted figures, um, if, especially if you're looking at a uh, figure of Christ here, um, really simplified facial features, uh, just these, these thick lines that are showing the outline of the body. And then we have also some kind of, you know, attempt at drapery, these little lines. It's not very naturalistically done at all. Um, it's much more abstracted, um, not very realistic or anything like that. Um, it's almost almost like a silhouette. It's almost just the silhouette of a person. Um, so again, the emphasis is just on, on recognition, on just, you know, making that connection uh, to your viewer and not necessarily telling the whole story or um, kind of uh, being detailed about it. Um, so, uh, not necessarily, again, just, just to make the point, again, that I've made about late antique art before, um, that one is not necessarily better than the other, and we also have to really um, take into account the situation of the people who were creating this, uh, which is the fact that this was, again, a, a kind of secret underground church. Um, it was just being practiced in homes. It was, you weren't allowed to practice it openly. So that means they probably couldn't get the best artists out there, right? They had to kind of 
uh, just deal with whoever, you know, maybe whoever in the congregation was a half decent artist um, and have them do this. So uh, it was it was definitely less resources they were working with. Um, and so that also even the simplistic style itself is kind of representative of the um, situation of the people who have this artwork. So uh, that was in Syria, as I said, um, and that is kind of where Christianity begins, you know, it starts out uh, in Judea and kind of, uh, uh, you know, expands from that nucleus. Um, but it does eventually make its way to Rome, as we've seen. Um, and one of the big reasons uh, for that, as we mentioned before, is this idea of missionaries, these disciples who went out and, and shared the, the teachings of Christ with the, the empire. And prior to the reign of Constantine, it's kind of a, a mixed bag about how many Christians there were in Rome. Um, so we see fleeting references to them um, kind of from very early on. So starting, uh, or at least maybe not starting, but I know in the reign of Nero, um, there's one historian who, who mentions that he persecuted Christians um, in response to that great fire that happened. And so um, he, he blames the Christians, but that's only one historian who's telling us that. And so we're, uh, he's writing a little bit later. So it's hard to, it's hard to tell how accurate that is. Um, we have other accounts that there were house churches in Rome. So there were ones like we saw at Dura Europis um, in the city of Rome. We have historical documents that tell us that. Um, one of them says that uh, 25 existed in the city prior to the year 315. Uh, in archaeology, we have not been able to find any evidence of that. Um, 25 is not many when you're looking at an entire city. So it's possible that we just haven't found them yet. It's also possible that um, Christianity was so practiced in secret that they these people didn't put anything on the walls. They didn't put any kind of marking that uh, you know, would have outed them as Christians. So maybe they were worshiping in homes, but they weren't decorating their homes in that way. So we really don't know. Uh, it's also just possible that that's an inflated number. So again, we just don't know. Um, but what we do know is that there's very, very little Christian presence materially in Rome prior to the reign of Constantine. Uh, prior to the reign of Constantine, it is not a Christian city at all at all. There is no nothing in there in the whole city that looks Christian. It is entirely pagan up until the reign of Constantine. Um, so once Constantine has this experience at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, that kind of changes everything as we've talked about. Um, and he starts to build more things and as we saw earlier use more iconography uh, that references Christianity and one of the things that he starts to build are churches. So out churches, not house church, not secretive house churches, uh, real churches. And uh, for Constantine and, and, and leaders in the city, um, again, it how much of it is is religiosity? How much of it is piety? We don't know. Uh, it's possible that because the population of Christianity was growing, it was sort of a public donation. It was a public gift to the people. If you wanna keep the people's support, uh, what do you give them? You give them things that they, they can use. That's what we saw with the theater of Pompey way back with these fora that people could use. Um, we see emperors building public structures. So churches are kind of the same way that if you wanna win favor with a large population in your city uh, who are Christian, maybe you're gonna build real places of worship for them so that they don't have to practice in homes anymore. They have public spaces to do that. Uh, but again, it could also be sort of his deep seated uh, feelings of piety. We don't know. Um, but either way, uh, architecture kind of becomes a symbol of this new religion, especially in, in Rome. Um, and again, this happens just very quickly. So um, Diocletian, you know, the first Tetrarch is, is a persecutor of Christians. And, um, you know, what, 15 years later or so, Constantine is suddenly building churches. So we see a, a quick turnaround there for sure. And so I want to talk about a few of these churches uh, in Rome. The first is Old St. Peter's Basilica. So uh, it's called Old St. Peter's Basilica because you may have heard of the new St. Peter's Basilica, which is the Vatican. Uh, so this was the old rendition of that. It was started around 325. So it was started under the reign of Constantine. Um, and it is uh, it was on the site of the current Vatican. So this was a, a predecessor to the Vatican. And uh, it was dedicated to St. Peter. So St. Peter was a disciple of Christ. Um, he was one that's featured heavily in the Acts of the Apostles. He's one of those people who went out afterwards and, and converted people to the Christian faith. Um, it's uh, uh, thought that he came to Rome 
um, and was kind of after he had done other travels, made it to Rome eventually, um, where he was finally martyred. So he was put to death um, because uh, of his Christian beliefs and the way that he was he was spreading the gospel. Um, and what's going to happen is that he is buried uh, in outside the city. So he's buried in a cemetery outside the city because as we've talked about, Romans did not bury people inside the city. It was kind of thought to be unclean. So they buried people outside the city walls on the outskirts of the city. So St. Peter, uh, after he is killed, is buried outside of the city. And his, uh, his followers, you know, he was kind of a, a big figure at the time, um, they want to commemorate him. And so what happens is this church is built over the site of his tomb. And this is very, very common in Christian churches going forward. Um, they are very often going to be built over someone's tomb, um, often a, a big figure in, you know, a saint, um, someone like that, someone that's very kind of known for their piety. Um, and St. Peter is specifically uh, notable because he actually knew Christ. And uh, in, in the Bible, it says that Christ gave him the keys to the kingdom. Um, and so sort of uh, marking him as a new leader, a new leader in the church. So he was definitely a leader of early Christianity. And so he's being honored with this church over his tomb site after he's martyred. So uh, what do we see in the uh, uh, construction of this in the architecture uh, that we see here. Well, it uh, does not look <laughs> like a pagan temple, right? <laughs> so um, you might be noticing, well, there's a few things. Okay, they both have a pitched roof, I guess. Um, they both have some columns, sure. Um, but it's much more similar to a basilica. So this is a basilica church. Uh, basilicas are the, uh, the form that is going to be used for many, many Christian churches moving forward. Um, and there's a few reasons why that is. First, uh, you might not want to uh, build your church that looks exactly like a pagan temple if you're trying to distance yourself from paganism. So if you're trying to mark yourself as a new religion, one that is fundamentally at odds with paganism, like they can't coexist, um, you might not want to build your religious site that looks just like a pagan site. You want to create some, some distance there. Um, the other thing is that basilicas in the Roman world, as we've talked about, big administrative centers, often very large buildings. And so there's kind of a practical purpose that they could just hold a ton of people. <laughs> and um, in, in Christian churches, the, the emphasis of the ritual, you know, the, the congregation, the worship, all of that happened indoors. So it was really dependent on an indoor meeting space where you could put a ton of people. If you think about churches now, um, you know, we even have like mega churches that are almost like stadium sized. Uh, it's all about fitting a lot of people inside the building. And that's where kind of the worship takes place. So uh, that's the same idea here that if they're trying to pick a, a, a form of architecture for their church and they know that they need something that fits a lot of people, Basilica is a good way to go. Pagan temples, not such a good way to go because uh, the emphasis on pagan temples is really outside. So the altar we've talked about, right, in pagan temples that they would always be outside. And that's why they have such a frontally oriented axis. They have the staircase right in the front um, because there would be an altar and then there would be the staircase up into the temple. And the temple was usually only accessed by um, kind of high ups in the religion, so priests. Uh, the general population didn't usually go inside temples because the ritual took place outside. Um, and if you've noticed, we haven't talked a ton about what the interior of temples looked like. Um, and that's because that's really not what their, what their other emphasis was. The emphasis was on the outside. That's different in Christianity. As I said, the emphasis is really on the inside and, um, you know, the, the worship and the congregation, the people, the gathering of people that are taking place there. So the, the design is going to reflect that. If I go back one, um, so look at it a little bit closer, it would have been kind of a large complex. So we see a little bit of a courtyard in the front, um, kind of actually similar to uh, the Basilica Ulpia. You know, I just showed that picture uh, where you have this open space and then you have the Basilica behind it. So kind of a gathering space. Um, a few things to note about churches, about Christian churches. Um, the first is that it's kind of a procession from um, uh, public or the most people who can who can enter to private and the most sacred elite people who can enter. Um, and it's actually interesting because it's a little bit similar to kind of the domus, the idea of the domus that um, in the front of the house, there's a big uh, public space, you know, anyone can kind of hang out in the, um, in, you know, the, the faucets or whatever. 
um, of the church or of the house, sorry, like that's kind of a more public place. And so here it even has the same name of an atrium, kind of a more little public space. Um, and then once you get into the narthex, that's the last place that um, people who are not baptized can hang out. Um, and this is, you know, specifically in the early church, right? So early church design. Uh, so the narthex is going to be this long rectangular space and it's right before you enter the sanctuary, which is called the nave. So the nave is that big open space. That would be like the big space of the basilica. This is the nave here. That's where all of the worshipers, all of the faithful gather. Um, but if you're not yet initiated, you're going to hang out either in the atrium or in the narthex. And that narthex is that last place that you can uh, be before the sanctuary. However, it goes beyond that. So if you are a baptized member, if you're worshiping in the nave, uh, you might not be able to enter the last spot, which is the apse, because that's kind of the real uh, uh, most holy place of the church. Um, that's where uh, the Eucharist is going to be kept. Uh, which is, a, a, you know, um, a very important part of Christian uh, ritual that kind of only the priests can handle. Um, and so all of that, uh, the altar is going to be in the apse. All of the most holy parts of the ritual are going to be happening in the apse. Um, and that's kind of just for clergy, just for priests. That's their section, that, their area. And you have the faithful and the nave, and then you have those who are um, not part of the faith uh, in the narthex or the atrium. So uh, that's what you see here. So narthex, nave, and then you can't really see, but there'd be an apse in the back, but you can see it here. So narthex, nave, apse in the back. Um, you can also see something uh, else uh, to note, a transept. So a transept is going to go perpendicular to the nave. Um, sometimes you'll even see it looking um, uh, kind of more directly like a cross. It'll be over here. Um, this is kind of a capital T, I guess, um, but we do see that a lot uh, moving forward. You'll see some cruciform churches, churches that really look like crosses and they're made with a nave and then a transept. Um, also over here, it looks like we might have baptistries. Baptistries were often um, round buildings, rotundas uh, moving forward in Christian church architecture. Um, and then again, also just like a basilica, you have aisles on either side. So St. Peter's was likely a uh, three-aisled basilica. So you have, uh, again, just more places for people to, to sit, to gather, all of that. All right, um, one last thing I wanted to mention. That's right. There we go. <laughs> um, also, you can see that they both have Claire stories. So that's also something that's going to uh, travel over from uh, secular Roman basilicas to Christian basilicas. Um, oh, that's right, when I was talking about aisles, um, the idea of side aisles also as an ambulatory. So you can kind of make your way around this uh, space and especially a lot of times the walls would have some kind of religious decoration on them. So you would want to uh, be able to kind of walk around the church. So the side aisles are really important for that too. Um, and we've talked about ambulatories way back, I think when we talked about um, Greek temples, right? Because uh, Roman temples don't have ambulatories. So there's no way you can walk around the middle of this structure. Um, there's, you know, they're just engaged columns along the wall. There's no space there. Um, but in basilicas, you can you can have that ambulatory, and that's going to be important uh, in Christian churches. Uh, here's another just similarity. So uh, perhaps a better size comparison for uh, the Basilica of Maxentius, built not too long earlier. Um, you can see where they would have been getting this inspiration from. Um, that they're 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 these architects in the city who know very well how to build big basilicas. Like I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to go as far to say maybe it was the same people who worked on it, but. The knowledge is definitely present in the city. However, this uh, contrasts, as you can see, with the other type of uh, early Christian church that we see, which is a centrally planned church. So if that was a basilica, this is a centrally planned church. And a centrally planned church uh, kind of is a, a little bit from the name, you might be able to tell, um, but the focus is on the center of it. So it's, it's, it's all planned around the center. The altar would be in the center and then everything else comes out around that. So speaking of an ambulatory, an ambulatory is almost even more important in a centrally planned church because it's almost, you have to walk like 360 degrees around the altar. Um, so there was much more of an emphasis on that in, in, in centrally planned churches than in basilicas because this, this round shape sort of facilitates uh, circular movement around an ambulatory. Uh, so this church that we're going to be kind of looking at as our case study for centrally planned churches is the Church of Santa Constanza. So this is also in Rome, also begun under Constantine. And it was actually uh, kind of 
meant to be or designed to be the tomb of Constantine's daughter. So uh, she has a lot of different names. I'll kind of hear it differently. Uh, Constanza, also Constantina, um, but that was his daughter. And uh, as kind of a royal woman, um, she has her, her tomb built and uh, similar to St. Peter's, the idea of putting a, a church over an uh, important person's tomb, right? There's kind of that connection between uh, a tomb as a burial spot and then a church over that. Um, and worthy to note that Constantine uh, uh, didn't have the best relations with everyone in his family, um, has his second wife executed, I think. Um, but uh, Constanza and his mother Helena are both very important to him, and they are both uh, Christians. They're, they're a little bit more out about their Christianity than Constantine is, who kind of, you know, you're not sure where he's at in the conversion process. Um, his mother and his daughter uh, convert much more fully and they're kind of out Christians. So it makes sense that there would be a church on her tomb because she was she was known to be a Christian. Um, so if we look at the plan of this a little bit more, it has the same um, types of features that a basilica has, but it's done a little bit differently. So we first already talked about the ambulatory, the idea that you can walk around. There's this, this side aisle uh, ringed by columns. Um, delineating spaces, and those would often be very decor decorative, and so lots of decorative features that you would want to walk around and look at. Um, they also have columns, so we saw on the basilica, uh, you know, columns delineating those, those aisles. And then they also have a narthex, so the same idea of moving from um, more public or more um, a space that more people can can hang out in, um, not just the faithful, you know, it's more generalized, kind of anyone can be there. Um, so that's in the narthex, and then you move into the sanctuary, into the nave, which we can kind of still call this a nave. It's not, not a rectangular nave, but still the same idea of that's where the people gather. Uh, you can move into the nave if you are part of the faithful, if you're a baptized member of the church. Um, so kind of that, that separation still exists in a centrally planned church. So here's some pictures of it today. So it still exists, uh, Santa Constanza. Um, and you can see also, yeah, so it's, uh, it has that narthex, that kind of cylindrical narthex, I guess. Um, and then you go into a rotunda and then the rotunda is not, it's kind of topped with a dome, but it's not as dramatic as a dome as we've seen. Um, it kind of has a little bit of a, a rotunda and then kind of another rotunda on top of that. Um, and then sort of just a domed ceiling over that. So it's not gonna be as dramatic as something um, like the Pantheon, for instance, um, which has this massive dome that covers the entire building. In this case, the dome kind of only covers the nave. So it doesn't go over the ambulatory. It doesn't go over those side aisles. It's just gonna be in the center over the altar. Um, so a little bit of a difference there between the Pantheon, which is the whole building has a dome. And then this one is gonna be just in the center. Another similarity is the Rotunda of Galerius that we talked about a couple classes ago. Um, so that's in Thessaloniki, and that was also supposed to be his tomb, right? So that was designed to be his mausoleum. Uh, so we see a similar thing, how it was turned into a church afterwards. So um, he wasn't actually buried there, but we often see um, rotundas used for kind of those things. So either a tomb, um, a church, sometimes a church and a tomb. Um, and then we also mentioned a baptistry. A lot of times baptistries are going to be um, centrally planned, they're going to be round rotundas. Um, so this is a form that's really taken off. And I mean, we started to see it in, with the Pantheon, but we start to now see different developments of that. Like I said, not putting the dome over the entire building, kind of just putting it over the most important part, the, the altar in the middle. Um, so kind of variations on that theme. If we look at the inside, so um, this is the inside today, and you can see that it's very lavishly decorated and it's really done with the use of mosaics. So we saw frescoes earlier um, in Dura Europa, so that was um, the, the, the wall paintings, frescoes, uh, but this is mosaic. So this is going to be those little tiles that you put together to make a scene. Um, and there's a great mosaic program, a lot still exists today. So we're gonna take a, a closer look at those. Um, they are most notably in the ambulatory. So as you walk around, that's what you're gonna be looking at. You're gonna be looking at all those mosaics around you. Um, and then there's also kind of these side apses in a way. So they still, again, we still have this idea of like an apse, a semicircular room, um, but these um, are not necessarily going to be where the altar is. The altar is gonna be in the middle because it's centrally planned. So um, these altars also kind of have mosaics in their half domes that we'll look at. 
But if we look at the mosaics and the ambulatory first, um, so what we see is uh, a very busy scene. So um, there's a lot going on, but it's all uh, vegetal, lots of vegetal imagery. So we see vines and grapes. Um, if you see there are like, there are, there's a vine and then there's grapes coming off of this. Um, we see these dancing figures who are like stomping on grapes. <laughs> so they're making wine and I guess they're like really excited about it because they're kind of dancing. <laughs> um, so we have like wine making, dancing figures. Um, we have someone over here who's kind of leading um, oxen who have maybe a wagon full of grapes. Um, so lots of, of imagery uh, uh, like about grapes and wine. A few reasons for this. Um, the first thing you might think of when you think of um, grapes or wine in a Roman context is Dionysus. So Dionysus, uh, the god of wine, the god of revelry kind of. Um, we've talked about his cult a lot. Um, but this is a Christian church and, you know, we know that Constantina was, was out about her Christianity. So this is definitely not a pagan context, it's going to be a Christian context. But again, we see them taking these, these pagan themes, um, or pagan iconography, I should say, and repurposing them into a Christian context. So we're taking imagery that's very familiar, that we're used to seeing as part of a religious context, um, maybe that our artists are very used to making. So uh, there's already kind of a, a knowledge base there about how to make these scenes, um, but we're gonna repurpose them to have a Christian meaning. And that Christian meaning um, is also a reference to uh, the Bible as well as Christian ritual. Um, so in the Bible, there's a Bible verse that uh, Christ says, um, uh, I am the vine and you are the branches. So similar things that we're seeing here, um, this, this kind of vegetal uh, wine imagery, so perhaps a reference to that. Um, there's also though in the uh, Christian ritual, um, the idea of the Eucharist, which is bread and wine, um, and it's, it's representing Christ's body and blood. So uh, that would be uh, eaten as part of the uh, worship, as part of the uh, kind of congregation. Um, and so maybe this is a reference to that too. So there's kind of multiple things. Um, we see multiple references to wine in Christianity. So it could have multiple meanings here, um, but interesting that it also has that kind of reference to Dionysian imagery. Um, and it's maybe familiar to people, especially maybe familiar to converts. If you are um, a growing church and, and you know, you've have these recent converts, you're kind of trying to make them feel a little bit more comfortable. <laughs> so you're trying to, to um, Make them feel like, hey, this is this is just what you were doing when you were a pagan. It's similar imagery, you know. This is this is a safe space. You're still uh, surrounded by by the known, so it's not too unknown. It's not too jarring to enter this new faith. It's kind of don't worry, you know. <laughs> this all should feel a little bit familiar. So um, definitely a tool for conversion as well. And then if we look in the um, apse mosaics, so remember this is a centrally planned church, so it's going to have a bunch of apses around the side. Um, and so we'd see different scenes here as well. So one of them is something I mentioned earlier, Christ giving the keys of the kingdom to St. Peter. So um, we see this as well, lots of uh, Peter imagery in Rome, like Peter and Rome are closely connected. Um, and so we see that in this one, handing the keys over. Um, and then we see uh, Christ uh, dispensing the law, giving the law um, kind of, because that was a lot of what his teaching was about, you know, how people should act um, and, and how, how to be moral, right? So uh, he's, he's giving the law, he's kind of preaching the law there. Um, so we see scenes of Christ and we know it's Christ because he's going to have that blue halo around him. Um, you can see uh, right there, right? So that's the um, halo. And then here, you look closely also, uh, still kind of continuing that vegetal theme. So we have grapes here um, and on this side as well. And then other kind of fruits, the bounty of the kingdom, maybe, I don't know. Um, but definitely grapes, which are continuing that same imagery from the ambulatory that you would have just been walking in. All right. To continue that kind of uh, same imagery, we're going to look at the sarcophagus of Constantina. So this is the same person, Santa Constanza, all the same person. Maybe I should have put the same name, but oh well. Um, so yes, the daughter of Constantine. Uh, as I said, Santa Constanza was her uh, mausoleum, essentially. Um, she was buried there, and so her sarcophagus is there, and it uh, it was on the property, and so this is where we have it today. Um, so if we look at the imagery on this sarcophagus, we see lots of connections to what was happening in her church. Um, before we do that, though, the first thing you should notice is that it is purple. It is made of porphyry. Um, we've seen this a few times, most notably in the Tetrarchy portrait. Uh, porphyry, a very expensive stone, um, this purple color and the stone itself, both signs of royalty, of someone who's very elite and maybe even connected to imperial wealth. 
So it makes sense that the daughter of the emperor would have a porphyry sarcophagus as a sign of her kind of royalty, of her wealth. Um, and also purple becomes a very common symbol of, or sign of, um, of royalty as well, and of wealth, of eliteness. Um, and we'll even start to see figures like Christ wearing purple as sort of a sign of his divine kingship in a way. So on this sarcophagus, uh, we see lots of uh, vegetal imagery again. So we see similar kind of vines. Um, we also see similar wine making scenes. So there's these cherubs, each one's kind of in a roundel, sort of a vine roundel. Um, and they're doing kind of different parts of the wine making process. So there's one harvesting grapes, one is transporting grapes and one is stomping grapes to make wine. And so um, these, again, these roundels created by vine tendrils. So um, more uh, uh, wine or grape references here um, and kind of echoing the, the mosaics that are seen in the church. And if we look below those roundels, we will see some animals. So uh, these are not random animals. They have, again, meanings imbued within them like we've seen with other Christian art. So um, the first is a sheep. So you'll see that in the middle, there's a sheep there. This is again, referencing what we've been talking about with Christ as the good shepherd. Uh, so Christ tending to his flock, the flock being humanity, being his believers, right? So um, we have that kind of marking her uh, as a Christian, marking the person here as a member of the flock, right? So that's, that's a reference to that. Um, and then on the two corners, so if you look uh, here, there's a bird and then there, and those are peacocks. And peacocks were common symbols of the resurrection. So these uh, peacocks in the corners are also kind of a reference to uh, the afterlife, to this idea of death. We're on a, a funerary work of art here. So the idea that um, Constantina has now passed over into the next life and therefore she's had kind of a resurrection, um, sort of similar to, to how Christ had a resurrection after being dead for three days. Uh, she's having a resurrection into, into the afterlife. So symbols of kind of her position as a Christian and then also uh, what's what where she's at now you know now that she has passed on and these are pretty common symbols uh, these animals specifically and especially related to funerary artwork so I want to use that as a segue to talk a little bit about catacombs so catacombs are underground you know subterranean chambers um, that are kind of like necropolises. So they're kind of like cities of the dead, like we saw with the Etruscans, that they would be uh, hewn from the rock and that is where people would be laid to rest. And we especially see these um, in Rome, we see Christian catacombs. So we're gonna look at a couple of those and the, the artwork therein. Um, you see a couple of, of examples just right there of uh, similar imagery. So we have a peacock um, on, on the ceiling of one, um, one catacomb wall, um, a little bit more elaborately done than those here, <laughs> looking a little bit more like a peacock. Um, and then we have an image of Christ as good shepherd, once again, with the, the one on his back and then the, the few at his feet. Uh, and so again, that idea of Christ as good shepherd. If we look at the catacombs as a whole, uh, they are, as I said, so they look subterranean. Um, they would have been outside the walls of the city of Rome. So again, we don't bury people inside the city. Uh, that's not the norm. We're gonna bury them outside the city, uh, even if it's underground. So these ones um, also uh, something to note about Rome is that it has kind of soft bedrock. So it's kind of easy to, to cut into it um, and to dig beneath and then create these chambers underground um, that, that it's pretty easy to slice through that rock. So uh, maybe another reason that they were able to create these kinds of um, uh, 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 elaborate or, or just um, winding tunnels of catacombs. So the people who were uh, laid to rest here would be either in, uh, they would be kind of in these chambers in the walls so that you would uh, kind of, of place them into the walls and then they would be covered with a, um, either a marble slab that was decorative or uh, just fresco kind of a, a painted fresco slab over it. Um, another thing to mention about catacombs, so they were open to all social classes. Um, you might see a difference between elite artwork and lower class artwork, um, but they were all kind of mixed together, kind of like the city of Rome, right? Even in our, our necropolises, we don't have zoning laws, we're all going to just mix together. Um, so open to all social classes. Um, they would have been pretty, you know, cold and dark down there, so you wouldn't really necessarily go to visit the dead very often. Um, it's not really a place you want to hang out. Um, but definitely a very, a very decorative place. So um, we'll look a little bit closer at some of these, um, but uh, you can see that the, the way that the walls are painted also is kind of in line with traditional Roman painting. Um, so we have those registers um, and this even almost looks like a dotto. Isn't that interesting? How it kind of looks like those are painted to look like rock or marble. And then we have this 
upper frieze, this upper scene. And then we even have some kind of architectural detailing, um, sort of like we see in maybe the third style, um, that really delicate ornate style where it's just very thin and decorated. So um, a different religion, but they're still Romans. So they're still the same culture, just a different religion using these same tropes of artwork in a, a new context. Um, and something else, a note about the elite versus kind of lower class. Um, if you were an elite person and you wanted to be buried with your whole family, you could get a whole room. So um, you could have your own room of the catacomb uh, where everyone in your family is buried there. And these were actually called a uh, cub cubicula. So uh, a singular cubicul cubiculum um, where it is a uh, kind of like a bedroom. That's the word for bedroom, right? So again, similar to the idea um, of an Etruscan necropolis, um, they had, uh, you know, triclinniums and things. <laughs> um, and so here we have bedrooms, we have uh, cubicula. So um, similar kind of ideas, you know, even it's, it's so long later, um, but we're in the same region. And so we still have these same kinds of cultural norms that stretch back centuries. Um, if we go back to this, so just another example of some, some good shepherd imagery that we see, uh, that's actually a different ceiling painting than the one I showed you a couple minutes ago. Um, so these are at different catacombs, you can see that. And then we also have a little st statue that was found. Um, it's only 39 inches tall, so not, not too tall, maybe like a little over three feet. Um, so it's not life size. Um, but it is also a statue of the Good Shepherd. So there is, is Christ and he's looking very like a, kind of like a stable boy there. He's looking very, very shepherdy. Um, he looks very young. He looks um, not super elaborately dressed. So this isn't Christ as king, as an elite figure. Um, he's kind of just a humble shepherd here. Um, and again, looking kind of young, a lot of shepherds were young, you know. So um, uh, we're kind of maybe also uh, hinting at Christ's humanity because Christ has this dual nature um, of, of man and God, which was heavily debated in this time period about how human he was and how God he was. That was the cause of a lot of debates, well, especially after this as well as, as the church grows. Um, but still this idea that he, uh, he, you know, was human. And so he's got this kind of humanity. Um, he's kind of a shepherd and maybe, you know, some shepherds, you know, and so you can kind of, you can relate to him in a way. Um, if we move forward, so something else that we see um, similarity with the uh, Etruscan tombs um, comes on the sarcophagus of Helena. So Helena is the mother of Constantine, um, the, the wife of Constantius. Uh, so she's a widow for, for quite a while, the entire time that Constantine is reigning. Um, but they have a pretty good relationship. And so he gives her a title and really um, puts her up nicely, you know, puts her, gets her a nice, uh, a nice villa and all of these things. Um, so on her sarcophagus, we also see that it's a porphyry sarcophagus. So it's purple, that purple stone, a sign of wealth, a sign of uh, kind of the elite nature of this woman, a very elite woman. Um, but the imagery on it is not quite what you would expect to see um, for a, a female uh, mother, mother of an emperor, <laughs> you know, a widow, a, a matron, a, mo a Roman matron. It's not that kind of imagery at all. So what we actually see are men on horseback. We see members of the Roman cavalry, so cavalry riders. And in this scene in particular, we see uh, three men on horseback and then underneath them, they have bound captives. And so they're kind of like almost trampling over these bound captives or maybe we're doing that thing where there's multiple ground lines. So maybe this is a ground line and that's a ground line and they're supposed to be kind of in the front and then the, the cavalry is in the back, unclear. Um, but either way, this is not something that directly relates to the life of uh, Helena, you know, not necessarily. Um, it does, it's military imagery. It, it, it might make sense for an emperor, but not really for a woman who wouldn't have fought in battles, wouldn't have been a member of the military. Uh, so many scholars believe that this sarcophagus was actually meant to be Constantine's sarcophagus, that it was built to be his, um, because you know they, they build them far in advance, you, you commission it in your lifetime. So, so it was made in Egypt, they think, because porphyry is an Egyptian stone, um, and so it was probably sent from Egypt to Rome, um, and it's also, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but Constantine dies, uh, he doesn't die in Rome, so also um, maybe that's why Helena um, gets it because by this maybe by the time she died Constantine was no longer in the city of Rome so they thought oh well he's not going to use it because he's not coming back so uh maybe that's why um but we also see some similarities with uh the one from Constantina so the daughter um so these possibly were made at the same time shipped at the same time so maybe we just kind of put some generic imagery on it and shipped it out and thought yeah someone will use it um, so yeah, so kind of uh, imagery that doesn't really match Helena, but the way that it relates to the Tomb of the Augurs um, is the idea that this might not be actually um, a scene of battle, 
but it might be more a scene of a triumphal procession or a military parade, something a little bit more uh, ceremonious or, or ritualistic in a way. Um, and it's even possible that this could be a sort of funerary games, sort of um, maybe a parade done in honor of someone uh, who has died. So if this was maybe, if it was Constantine, you know, he would have had a lot of soldiers um, showing up and, and circling his tomb, right? We've talked about how they did that. If you think back to the, um, the pedestal of uh, Antoninus Pius, the column of Antoninus Pius, um, and we see those people, people on horseback and we see them making that, um, that circular motion. And so maybe that's kind of what's happening on the sarcophagus because it goes all the way around. So um, on each side, there's these men on horseback. So maybe it's a sort of more of a ritual um, happening in honor of the dead. Um, and there's also some thought that it could be also maybe more funerary games. And so that's why I have the, the reference to the Tomb of the Augurs again, um, because on that one, we see those, those uh, wrestlers. Those, so those people who are wrestling in honor of the dead in, in, in part of these uh, funerary games. So. Um, that is the sarcophagus of Helena. Um, a couple of other things that I just want to mention about Helena um, is that she was a very pious Christian. She uh, adopted the religion fairly early on, um, really uh, uh, kind of threw herself into it, um, and she is uh, perhaps best known for actually going to Jerusalem. So she goes to Jerusalem, which is where Christ was crucified, and she tours it, and she sees all of these relics, which are... Um, uh, items that are associated with holy people or even parts of holy people's bodies. So things like bones or something. And um, she sees a lot of things that it's uh, unclear if they're real or not. So she sees a lot of things that are like kind of too good to be true. Like she sees a piece of Christ's uh, crib from when he was a baby. Um, so a lot of this is kind of mixed with like legend versus uh, historical reality, um, just because it seems hard to believe that his uh, a piece of Christ's crib would still exist 300 years later, um, but you never know. <laughs> so uh, Helena goes there and basically just gets a tons of things. Um, she gets like a finger bone of St. Thomas, who's a disciple of Christ, um, and all of these things, and she kind of is prepared to bring them back to with her to Rome. And one of the biggest things that she brings is a piece of the true cross, so a piece of the cross cross um, where Christ was crucified. And this is kind of the biggest thing, um, that the, the, the kind of biggest uh, <laughs> relic that she gets. So she goes to Jerusalem, has this, this great adventure there, you know, finding all of these relics, comes back to Rome and builds a, a chapel in a church on her site. So she was living at the time um, at a Severan imperial palace. So an imperial palace that was built under the Severans and then Constantine gives it to her to live in. Uh, so she goes to Jerusalem, brings back all of these items to her villa, and because it was once an imperial palace, kind of, um, it had sort of administrative areas as well. So one of them was like this big imperial hall, this big kind of rectangular room. And so she actually converts that into a basilica. So she turns it into a church. That church still stands today. It's called, it's called uh, Santa Croce in Jerusalem. So uh, it translates to the Holy Cross in Jerusalem or of Jerusalem. Um, so it's a reference to her bringing that piece of the true cross back to Rome. And uh, she puts it on display here, it is, uh, especially in this side chapel, which we call the Chapel of St. Helena. Um, and so she has this, this church on her property, and that church is displaying these really holy relics. And um, the hall, although I, I, don't, I don't have a, couple, a bunch of pictures of it because it doesn't look at all the same today since it was redone, I think, in the Renaissance. Um, so it looks very different, um, but it would have been a, a basilica. So this is uh, the chapel that's dedicated to her in that church today, kind of a side chapel. And another thing that still has, uh, actually, and that is probably from that long ago, um, because of the way that this church has been has been preserved and dealt with, um, is actual dirt from Jerusalem. So she that was one of the things that she brought back, um, was, was dirt from Jerusalem, from the site where Christ was crucified. So um, holy dirt, essentially. <laughs> and uh, it's hard to see, but it was right, it's right there. There's sort of this glass chamber in the ground and it's filled with dirt and that is dirt from Jerusalem. So um, Helena, very pious. And um, as you can see, the chapel of St. Helena, she was later sainted. So we are now going to move to the conclusion of our course. And there were a lot of different places that I could have ended this course. Um, lots of different emperors and there's lots of different arguments made about when kind of the Roman empire ends. Uh, I chose to end it in 330, and that is because that is the year that Constantine is going to move the capital uh, of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople. So 
the Roman Empire is no longer going to be headquartered in Rome. And for that reason, I feel like that is a good conclusion for our course, because this course is Roman art and architecture. And we've looked at Rome from its very beginnings, from its founding. Um, and so it makes sense, I think, to, to end it uh, when Rome as a city um, is no longer the focus of the empire. And we've, we've kind of been talking about this a lot. We talked about it early on, you know, we talked about it with Augustus rebuilding the city of Rome. And we looked at the Roman Forum and the way that it developed over centuries and got added to. And if you remember, in I think the first lecture, I said something about how the Roman Forum is always kind of an indicator of what's happening in the empire. As the forum grows, the empire is growing. And so, it's the city of Rome is kind of the same way that the city of Rome is sort of a metaphor for the rest of the empire. And we've talked about more recently this uh, move away from Rome, that when we have the tetrarchy and we have these different rulers in these four different quadrants of the empire, uh, Rome starts to lose some of its significance and some of its power. We have emperors even, you know, like Severus we talked about, uh, who's from North Africa. So they're from the provinces. Not every emperor is born in Rome. So this is sort of a, a change that has been a long time coming, but Constantine is finally going to be the one to enact it. So in 330, he decides to found Constantinople. He founds it uh, in modern day Turkey. Not, uh, it's also known as Istanbul today. So the same city. Uh, back then in Constantine's time, it was known as Byzantium. And it is an ancient city, an ancient Greek city. Uh, it's all part of that wider Greek world. It was founded in 657. So it's, it's a city that's been around for a while, but it was never um, that significant in terms of larger, uh, and larger empire. Um, so Constantine is going to come in and seriously uh, give it a makeover, give it a new name after himself. So Constantinople. And uh, he's going to implement a lot of things in this city uh, that are a typical Roman city would have, and he's going to, to make it the um, kind of fit for an emperor. So uh, a few things, you know, a forum, a hippodrome, a colonnaded street. It's in the east, right? So it's an eastern province, so it gets a colonnaded street. Um, and then he's also going to build churches. So he's going to build uh, Christian churches in the city, and that is really significant because from the get-go, he is marking this as a Christian city. And it is the new uh, capital of the Roman Empire, and the new capital of the Roman Empire is a Christian city. So that definitely sets the tone for how, how the empire is going to unfold later on and where it's headed. It's not heading back to, to paganism because it's now headquartered. Its most important city is now a Christian city. It's not the city of Rome with such a long pagan past. So we're really seeing a break there. Um, the city of Constantinople uh, is, is fairly small in, in Constantine's lifetime, but it's going to really expand with all of the emperors who come after him, who continue to live in the city, continue to build up the city. So uh, perhaps most significantly is Justinian, who is going to uh, build Hagia Sophia in 537, uh, which is this massive church that you see there. Um, it's remodeled many times since, so there's lots of things added to it, like the minarets um, from when the Ottomans conquered. Um, but we see uh, it is a centrally planned church, so it's, it's a, a rotunda. Um, it has a massive dome on top, massive, massive dome, um, and it's very lavish on the inside. Um, and so Byzantium, um, as, a, as an empire, the Byzantine Empire, Empire um, is sort of what comes next. And so um, we have Constantine moving the, the, the capital in 330. In 476, uh, it's what we know is traditionally the fall of Rome. If you hear about the fall of Rome, usually people are referencing the actual uh, fall of the city. So 476 is when the city is uh, taken um, by uh, Germanic tribes who come through and sack the city. Um, it's the first time that's happened in, uh, gosh, 800 years or something, uh, something like that, a really long time. Um, and you'll notice that the last uh, emperor, the one that it falls to, is named Romulus. So uh, Rome as a, as a city starts and ends with Romulus. Uh, but the, the idea of an empire kind of continues. And so even though Rome itself has fallen, Constantinople is the capital. So that's where it's headquartered. Um, and so we really see this empire continue in the East so much so that people in li living in that half of the empire are calling themselves Romans. So to them, this is the same empire. To them, uh, all of their emperors are, are Roman emperors. They're descended from these same the same line of emperors. Um, so today we call it the Byzantine Empire, and there's sort of this idea that it really is a different empire. And that's really not the case. It was a reduced empire. It was the eastern half of the Roman Empire, um, but so many of their customs and of their, their political systems and just their, the way that they saw their history, um, sort of their memory, was very much wrapped up in their Romanness. 
1453, this is when I call the, the, the fall of the Roman Empire, um, when Constantinople uh, is taken by the Ottoman Empire and becomes uh, an Islamic city. And interesting to note that Constantinople falls under an emperor named Constantine. So Constantinople starts and ends with Constantine. Uh, so a bit of uh, mirroring there. Um, if we do look at uh, Byzantine artwork, you'll see also that it is a continuation of sort of these late antique tropes that we've been talking about. So um, we talked a little bit about the architecture. Their biggest church is a centrally planned church that we've seen like in things in Rome, it takes inspiration from the Pantheon or from um, Santa Constanza, things like that. Um, in terms of their figural depictions, so um, here's an apse mosaic inside Hagia Sophia from eight, uh, 867. And um, you'll see that it's very flat. It's very frontally oriented. So you can see the whole width of her body of the Virgin Mary. Um, she is seated and this, uh, this kind of large blue cloak is on her. And if you look at the drapery, it's very stylized. It's not like classical drapery. It's very these, these uh, straight kind of hard lines that are creating the drapery in her fabric. And um, so these, these kinds of same tropes, and then if you look closer at their eyes their, and their uh, face, it's very abstracted. It's not naturalistic. Um, it's, it's, it's a much more stylized kind of art, um, similar to the, the trends that we saw with late antique uh, sculptural and, and then figural depiction. Um, so uh, if you want to talk about the fall of the Roman Empire, as I said, um, that really comes in my mind in 1453. In terms of the West, we see um, kind of a fragmentation of the West into more um, tribal uh, affiliations. And so, um, and so that's how we see these sort of um, countries arise. And then we have the idea of, of kings um, as well as the Holy Roman Emperor, um, which will also uh, kind of, of be, uh, see themselves as an extent, extension of these Roman leaders that came before them, although there was a little bit of a gap between. Um, so, that's where we are in the medieval period. If we go now um, to the Renaissance, that's where we see this rebirth of Greco-Roman antiquity, um, especially in Italy. So the Italian Renaissance, um, we're looking at the, the 16th, 17th century here for um, St. Peter's Basilica. So they are going to rebuild the old St. Peter's Basilica into what we have today. St. Peter's Basilica, also known as the Vatican, uh, designed by Michelangelo, and they're going to use so much um, inspiration from the Romans. Um, so if you look at the way that the, the pediment is done and or the facade is done, um, they have a dome, um, this kind of marble paneling on the interior, uh, these Corinthian columns or Corinthian pilasters that we see on the sides. Um, so much of this is inspired by their, their Roman past um, that they're, they're rebirthing in this period. Um, and if we move forward even more, we start to see that, you know, in the 18th century. So we talked about Winkelmann at the beginning of the course. Um, something that he was really inspired by was the excavation of Pompeii, which started in 1738 um, and still is ongoing today. It's been going for centuries, <laughs> the excavation of this city. Talked a lot about that. Um, but these, uh, as soon as they start to excavate, it started to be published widely in, in newspapers and, and the media. And people become, again, really interested in Greco-Roman antiquity. Um, people like Winkelmann, who, who begins this discipline of art history, of, of looking at artwork um, in sort of uh, not exactly the same way that we do today, but um, definitely the, the inspiration for our discipline today um, comes from things like the excavation of Pompeii and looking back to our antique past. If we move forward even more, um, we see the founding fathers taking inspiration from Rome. So we see them uh, thinking about the, the American Republic, right? The idea of a Republic like the Romans had um, and kind of creating Washington DC and really just yeah, the American nation as sort of this new Rome. They, that's who they are emulating in their minds. They're reading ancient authors and they're discussing philosophy and they're looking back to Greco-Roman antiquity for ideas of how to design their new country. And we see this a lot reflected in their architecture and their art. Um, so the Capitol building, which was started in 1793, is it absolutely a rotunda. Um, so it looks a lot you know, like the Pantheon. We have a, a round building with that dome on top. Um, it has a statue on the top, kind of like the, the column of Trajan might have had. Um, and of course, these columns and that sort of temple facade across the front. So this neoclassical architecture really takes off um, and continues even until the early 20th century. I mean, look at the Lincoln Memorial. Um, we talked, I, I think I referenced it a little bit when we were talking about the Colossus of Constantine uh, in the Basilica of Maxentius, that um, this idea of this colossal statue um, seated and kind of uh, and a little bit of an apse um, that people come to, can come and visit. And it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, this, you think of it as a great figure, whoever that Colossus is. And of course we see the Lincoln Memorial as well, looking very much like a temple facade. It has Doric columns. 
it has sort of rosettes or something that we've we've seen before. So um, and of course, all of this done in white marble. Um, they don't paint their buildings like the uh, the ancients would have. They just go with the white marble unpainted, which would have looked very strange to an ancient Roman. But there you have it. So I think if we think about the legacy of realm, um, we can think about it in a lot of different ways. Uh, but the way that sticks out to me, especially um, when we think about what was important to the Romans and how they saw their empire, how they uh, wanted to be remembered and, and what they were always striving for. We have talked a million times in this class about the emphasis on triumph, on victory, uh, these triumphal arches that were built in the city of Rome. And then we see them across the empire it was um, such a point of pride for Romans to, to conquer other people and to, to uh, have a triumph, right? To be triumphal. Um, and I think in their minds, they saw each triumph as an extension of the empire. Every time they conquered someone else, they, their empire grew, right? And so um, although they may have thought that this would be an eternal empire with all of their success, um, we know that that doesn't end up happening. Um, but I think the biggest triumph that Rome had the biggest victory, at least in my mind, maybe this is my my own argument, um, would be in the, the art and architectural styles that they leave us. I mean, that's perhaps their biggest footprint on the world. Of course, we can talk about political systems. Um, and I would say, you know, I think I, that's obviously a huge one as well. Um, but there's so many Roman forms that we walk past every day. And we almost don't even think of them as Roman anymore, right? When you see the Arc de Triomphe, you don't maybe necessarily think of Roman uh, art, or at least maybe you didn't before this class. If you look at Washington Square Park, um, you maybe don't think of that arch necessarily as the Romans. It's sort of just part of our, our world today. Um, and so for them to be so deeply embedded um, in our culture with, with art and architecture, I think is perhaps um, one of their biggest legacies um, and perhaps the way that they triumphed the most. So. Um, I just want to thank you so much uh, for, for being with me in this class. I really appreciate it. Um, some of you might not know that this is actually my first class I've ever taught. So um, I graduated with my master's from UC Davis in June of last year. Um, and I was, I was really lucky to get this opportunity. And I was so grateful to, uh, to be able to teach um, on one of my favorite topics. So um, I'm actually starting a PhD in the fall. So you won't necessarily see me back at Davis. But um, I hope you take more history classes, more classics classes. Um, and continue to, to kind of follow um, whatever art, whatever you're interested in, because um, that's what I'm doing and um, it's been great. So thank you so much again for this uh, opportunity for being with me and um, have a great finals week and a great rest of your year. Thank you so much.